Hello everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Harsha Nikhar and welcome to B-Side Las Vegas. Uh, this talk is on open source GitOps for detection engineering presented by Zach Wasserman. A few announcements before we begin. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor Adobe and our gold sponsor Prisma Cloud Blue Cat Toyota. It's with their support and other sponsors, donors and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being live streamed, so as a courtesy to our speaker and audiences, we would like to ask you to check that your cell phones are on silent mode. And if you have any question, please use the audience microphone so that YouTube can hear you as well. And with that, let's get started. Please welcome Zach. Thank you and welcome everyone to the talk. So as you heard, my name is Zach Wasserman. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Fleet, and I'm the co-creator of OS Query and on the technical steering committee for that project. So a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today ties into the work that I've been doing going back to 2014 on OS Query. Uh, I also do lots, lots of other things in my free time. Uh, if it were not 105 degrees outside, I'd love to be climbing out at Red Rock Canyon. For those of you who don't know, if you ever come to Vegas and not the summer, highly recommend checking it out. It's beautiful up there. So I want to deconstruct a little bit all of the buzzwords within the title of this talk. So starting with detection engineering, what's that? And, and I pulled some quotes that I found from other folks explaining their idea of it. And then I'll try to synthesize it into my idea of what we're trying to do here. So detection engineering transforms an idea of how to detect a specific condition or activity into a concrete description of how to detect it. That's Florian Roth. Detection engineers design and build security systems that constantly evolve to defend against current threats. And that's Josh Day. And so to me, detection engineering is kind of the next evolution in what we're doing as security defenders. So 10 plus years ago, we had antivirus doing really basic stuff like looking for specific file hashes. We moved on to EDR and tools that kind of automatically perform detections and then response based on the things that they detect. And I think that the future that we're moving towards is detection engineering and incident response as kind of a full on role, a real engineering role within the organization, moving beyond typical analysts responding to alerts, but really understanding the needs of the organization, building detections that meet those needs, and then being able to do incident response based on a deep understanding of the particular organization's needs, threats, and, and risks. So next we come to GitOps, which I also think of as detection as code in this case. And this is really adapted from the DevOps philosophy of configuration as code. So something that, that folks in the software engineering and the infrastructure world have been doing for 10 to 15 years now. But I think it's a bit newer here for those of us in the security world. So what is GitOps? Using pull requests in a version control system like Git introduces visibility into the deployment process. It lets you view and track any changes made to a system. It provides an audit trail and gives you the ability to roll back changes if something breaks. That's from Red Hat. Detection as code is a modern, flexible, and structured approach to writing detections that applies software engineering best practices to security. So again, we can take these things that we've been doing with off-the-shelf tools, that we've been doing with click ops, if you will, clicking around within UIs, triaging alerts, and we can turn it into code. And this doesn't necessarily have to mean like everyone has to become a software engineer and be, be able to write complete software systems, but we can start to specify using text, using YAML configuration files, using JSON, maybe writing a bit of Python, writing a bit of SQL, we can specifically encode what it is that we're looking for and use that to be a bit more rigorous about our practices. 
And like mentioned in that one quote, it also gives us the ability to collaborate, review the changes that are being made, and understand what has changed over time and build that audit trail. And then open source. Broadly speaking, open source software licenses make the source code available for use, modification, and distribution based on agreed upon terms and conditions. That's Janelle Harcasitas. OSS, or open source software, is not only available for anyone to use, but also to build on. This has resulted in a global network of contributors who work together on a project by collectively reviewing, testing, documenting, and patching code. And this is Richard Stallman. Some of you may recognize him, a real zealot for open source software. And, and we'll come back to him briefly in a bit here. But I think the really important and cool thing about open source is that it provides this opportunity for collaboration. We can build tools at one organization, which, for example, you'll see in my story, I helped to build OS Query at Facebook, now Meta, and that's a tool that we can now take advantage of across organizations. And additionally, we don't have to just be okay with what comes out of the box. We can integrate, again, deeply into what we understand of the organizations that we're working to protect. And I think that it's that flexibility and that freedom that's really exciting about open source and that allows us to be more effective when we try to do detection engineering. So now I'm going to talk about the tools in the stack that we're going to be introducing here. So in this talk, what I want to do is show you one model for how you could put together a framework for doing detection engineering using GitOps and using open source tools. So something that you could take home today, deploy in your organization or in your home lab for free and adapt it to modify to your purposes and best suit your needs. So first we've got OS Query. And OS Query allows you to write queries, SQL queries. So those of you who've worked with databases have seen this before. Write queries to collect logs on the state of your devices. And it supports Mac, Linux, and Windows. So by learning one syntax and one tool, now you're able to collect logs and, and understand the state across likely almost all of the computing devices that you manage. Doesn't include mobile yet. Um, and I will actually talk briefly about how there's some Chrome OS support coming through other work that we've done, not directly in OS Query. And again, while we talked about detection as code, configuration as code, I really do think that this allows non-developers to access and aggregate data across all of the different sources on these different operating systems. So you don't have to write a whole program if you want to get at a new data source. You can use one of the many data sources that's already built into OS Query, and you just have to learn the little bit of syntax and the little bit of configuration that OS Query provides in order to start collecting these logs across all the different disparate data sources. And OS Query has been designed from the ground up to have the performance and reliability to deploy across corporate and production infrastructure. So today, OS Query is deployed across millions of endpoints. It's integrated into multiple commercial products. And it's been deployed across production infrastructure of hundreds of thousands of servers at organizations like Facebook, Google, Apple. So this is a really robust system, but it's also really accessible and something that we see folks deploying down to tiny organizations. And again, it's free. It's open source. You can modify it. You can use it however you want. And you can make it fit your needs if it doesn't yet. And there's a community that's supporting it. And you're all welcome to join the community and help to support it. And this is kind of what it looks like. You want to get all the users on the system that you're running on? You write a simple SQL query, select star saying, give me all the information from the users table. And this is going to give you all the users. 
And again, this works across all the platforms. So whereas on, on Mac and Linux, you might look at Etsy password to get users, and then you'd have to look in some other places to get information about the groups those users are in and, and other metadata about the users. On Windows, you'd look in a completely different source. With OS Query, you just have to write this query, and you get that kind of normalized across all of the different operating systems that you might be working with. And there's a huge, huge number of data sources, something like 300 different tables across all of the operating systems. So it means you can get data from flat files like Etsy hosts or Etsy cron tab, the known host files. Each of these has its own table in OS query. And instead of you having to write that parsing logic, again, you just write this select star from Etsy hosts, select star from cron tab, select star from known hosts. And OS Query gives this to you again in that normalized format. OS Query can open SQLite files, which are becoming increasingly popular to use to store configuration about programs on systems. It can call a number of system APIs. Um, so here's some examples from Mac OS, but there's system APIs on Linux, Windows, pretty much everything you can imagine wanting to know on a system, these APIs are available. And again, you don't have to write C code, C++, Objective-C, any of that. You just write your query, and OS Query exposes that information because someone else has already written the C code for interacting with these APIs. Then there's application APIs, so you can get things like status from Docker, from Carbon Black, uh, and people have written extension tables that interact with things like CrowdStrike. And we can get event-based APIs. So FS events is used to do file integrity monitoring on some systems. The Linux audit and BPF subsystems are used to do process auditing, socket auditing. On Windows, there's support for ETW, um, and there's file integrity monitoring and process auditing on Windows as well. And again, unified interface. So there's a lot of code going on under the hood that you do not need to pay attention to in order to use OS Query effectively to get at these things. You can get metadata about the file system, hashes of files, the permissions, and you can parse various kinds of structured data. For example, on Mac OS, a lot of configurations are stored in plists, and this all comes ready to go in OS Query. And again, just to underscore it for the 10th or 11th time probably, it's all available under the same SQL interface. So you don't really have to learn more than just the one interface. And then you can look through that entire schema and get, see all of the information that you can get across all of these different sources. And I showed you a simple example of a query before, but because this information is all exposed in this unified interface, you can also start to combine data together from the different tables. So normally, if you wanted to get some information about a process, say on Linux, you might run PS to see the running processes. And then if you want to know about what sockets are open on those running processes, then you might run LSOF to see the open files. And you'd have to probably write a script or something to put that data together and start to filter it and look for what you're used to. But in OS Query, you can use, again, the SQL syntax. And obviously, this is a little bit more complex. But we're saying, give us all the information from the processes running on the system, joined with the open sockets for those processes, and, and use the, the, the PID when you're doing that join. And specifically, we're looking for SSHD processes and ones where the, the local port that they have open is not port 22. So at a high level, I would explain this query as find us SSHD processes that are running on a non-standard port, not the standard port 22 that we're used to for SSH. And so I'm just giving this to you as kind of an illustrative example of how this unified interface allows us to start to, start to express slightly more complex ideas, but again, without having to write like long and complex scripts or code. Like this isn't trivial but this is not particularly hard to learn.
So next in our tool stack, we come to fleet. And the purpose of fleet in this situation is primarily to deploy and manage OS Query at scale. So OS Query, as we just talked about, is a piece of software that runs on the individual endpoint that you manage. But more than likely, you have hundreds, thousands, tens, or hundreds of thousands of endpoints that you're managing. And so Fleet helps to get those agents installed on the endpoints, helps to configure them once they're installed, and then helps us to get the logs where we want them. Fleet also allows us to take those kind of queries that we talked about there, run them live, so get the results from what from that query right now across all of the different systems that are enrolled. Fleet builds a little bit of higher level use cases on top of that, like detecting vulnerable software, compliance with organizational policies or policies from actual compliance frameworks, and allows triggering automations like into ticketing systems or through webhooks or that kind of thing. And then Fleet can configure the schedule of queries that OS Query runs. So by writing a bit of YAML, so just a structured text file, we can tell Fleet, have our OS Query agents run these particular queries on the schedule that we specify. And then OS Query will run those queries and send the logs back up to Fleet. Fleet can then dispatch those logs to whatever logging destination you want. These are kind of the most common that we usually see S3, Elastic Stack, Splunk, Snowflake. And so Fleet makes it pretty easy to, to modify the queries that we have running and get the results into the place that we want. Oh yeah, and I said we'd mention Chrome OS. So OS Query itself doesn't support Chrome OS, but at Fleet we've built an also open source Chrome extension that allows you to get the same kind of SQL interface on uh, Chrome OS devices, so Chromebooks, and will then show up in the same dashboard along with the rest of your Mac, Linux, and Windows devices. I should say that Fleet is technically, you might call it open core. Uh, so part of Fleet is MIT licensed, which is true open source by Richard Stallman's uh, definition, it is not truly open source through the whole thing because there are features in Fleet that are enterprise licensed. So while Stallman is very triggered, everything I'm going to be talking about here today in the talk is actually open source and can be used by you for free. The code can be inspected and modified and we won't really focus on the enterprise features at all. And here's an example of what things look like in Fleet. So in the middle there, we see query, and this is just a regular OS query query. But we can also store all of this other metadata about the query. Uh, Fleet will help us see which platforms it's compatible with. It will allow us to set permissions on who can run the queries. And then it will allow us to save and schedule those queries. And we talked about YAML configuration as code. So here's a somewhat equivalent example of of what it looks like to schedule a query using configuration as code. So we say that you know this is a query that we're trying to schedule. We can put a name and description. We put the actual SQL for the query. And then we can set things like the interval that we want the query to run on and how we want the logging to take place. So we can see how this starts to be a building block for doing detections as code. And the last tool that we'll talk about in this stack is called Matano. And Matano is a security data lake. So it's comparable with something like a, a Snowflake or a Splunk. And primarily it's designed to ingest data from S3. It can also automatically ingest from a number of data sources within AWS and uh, GitHub and a number of other tools. But for our case, it's really ingesting the data from S3 because as we talked about, OS Query and Fleet can write the data into S3. So that's our connection point here. And Matano stores the logs in a structured format. And then it allows us to write detections as code. 
And we'll see in a minute a little bit what this looks like. And we said Python here, so we're talking about real code in this case. But again, don't worry. This is pretty simple. Like You don't have to be a software engineer to apply these concepts. And Matano is built on AWS serverless technologies, so you deploy it yourself, but it, it really is pretty closely tied with AWS. And Matano, again, is, is truly open source, Apache 2 license, so you can use it, modify it, and deploy it however you want. So this is what a detection looks like in Matano. So it is code, but it's pretty simple. Essentially, we just write a function that does a Boolean evaluation. And it can be arbitrarily complex. The function takes a record or basically a log line as an input. And we say whether that log line should generate a detection or generate an alert. And so in this case, this is an example from their documentation. So looking at Zeek logs, so network logs. But you can imagine how this could apply to pretty much any kind of logging that you might pull in. And you can see again how this is encoded as text. And this can be put into a source control system and allow us to do Git ops and detections as code. And then Matano also provides built in alerting capabilities. Right now, that's primarily Slack. And these alerts that are generated can be configured again through code to include any of the relevant information that you might want your detection engineers or your, your response engineers or your security analysts to have access to when triaging the alerts. And so I'm going to talk a bit about the data flow of how these tools come together. And I think we've seen some hints as to how that will work based on the way these interfaces work. But we'll go through it a bit more concretely here. So Fleet configures OS query with a schedule of queries. So as the administrator, as the, as the blue teamer, the defender, I go to Fleet, maybe in the UI, but probably in this case, since we're talking about GitOps, through GitHub, GitLab, wherever we're storing our configurations. And I'm modifying that schedule of queries. Fleet then sends those queries up to OS query which becomes responsible on each individual endpoint for running the queries on the schedule. And then OS query sends the results that are generated back to Fleet. Fleet then pushes those query results into S3. And this is done typically via AWS Firehose, which makes it very easy to get the results into S3. And as I said, Matano then knows how to ingest logs from S3 and run detections on the logs that are coming in. So that's the basic data flow of how this system works. And so then how does it correspond with the GitOps workflow that we're trying to get to? So again, the, the user, the administrator, will update that YAML to create or modify a query so that we're pulling data, the initial telemetry in that we're going to be building our detections on. Then we would update the Matano detection YAML to create and modify the detection. And it's not just the YAML, but it's also that Python function. I'll show more about what the YAML looks like as we go through this. And then you'd commit and push changes into your Git repo. For most folks, this is probably a pull request on GitHub. And then we'd have a peer, another person on the team, review and approve the changes. And this, this I think, is an important part of doing like a real Git ops and detection as code process. Because this is where we're generating the audit log. This is where the author of these things explains like why are they making the changes that they're making. This is where someone else on the team verifies that this is in line with the goals of the team and, and makes sense for where we want to head. And once that things are approved, then either the reviewer or the original author can merge the pull request. And when that's done, the CI system, so in the case of GitHub, 
GitHub Actions, but again, could be any CI system, will then push the changes live. And here's a demo of, of what that looks like. So here I've put together a pull request to add the detection for the unusual SSHD. So looking for SSHD running on ports other than port 22. And I've committed this to Git and pushed it up as a pull request to GitHub. And we can see here that I've defined the query in the fleet schedule. So I've named the query, I've added a small description, and then I've put the actual SQL for the query. And that's the same query that we were looking at earlier in the example from OS Query. I've set an interval for the query to run on, in this case, every 10 seconds. And then I'm looking at, and then I've set the detection portion with Matano. In this case, it's a pretty simple detection. So I'm just saying any time this query generates a result, I want to trigger a detection. So I'm really just looking for the name of that query in the result log. And then Matano in the detection.yaml allows us to specify more details that will go into the eventual alert that's generated. So a display name, description, uh, run book, like what should, what should the defender do when they see this, references, known false positives, and mapping to the attack framework. And then an alert configuration. So in that case, what you saw was configuring to send alerts to Slack. And we can see here that I've configured GitHub to not allow merging the pull request until it's been approved by another reviewer. And I think this is a great way to kind of enforce rigor in the process. So let's not let like lone wolves make actions that, that have significant changes. So now we flipped over to another user in GitHub. And this user has now been requested for review on this pull request. So it's their opportunity now to take a look at the code. It's the same thing that we were just seeing a minute ago. Presumably the user is taking more than the 30 seconds that I take here to run through this to think about how does this impact our logging pipelines? Does this detection match with our goals? Does it do what it's saying it does? But in this case, let's say it looked great. So the reviewer says, looks good to me, approves it, and submits that review. So now we pop back over to, oh, and so the reviewer could merge it at that time. I usually like to follow the idea that the person who originally created it will, uh, will merge it because it gives them any opportunity to make any further changes or request further review if they want that. So we refresh the page here and we see that now the changes have been approved. Everything has gone green. Thanks to the reviewer for, for making this review. And now we can merge the pull request. So when we do this, it's going to take the proposed code and actually push it into our main branch in our repository. And we see that generates a commit on the main branch. And if we click over into here, we can see now there's a GitHub action that's running. And this GitHub action I've configured to apply the configurations that have been updated anytime a pull request merges to main. So the action goes through a few steps. First, it installs the Matano command line tool. That takes a few seconds. Then it applies the fleet configuration. We can see that it applied three queries. Basically, it's the two existing queries and the one new query that was added. And then it deploys the new detection into Matano using the command line tool that we did. So from start to finish, this takes under a minute here once the things have been approved. And now this becomes another detection in our pipeline. And so now I'll talk a bit about what deploying this whole system looks like. So for Fleet, typically you deploy in the cloud via Terraform. It's really common to use AWS for this, but it's also really supported anywhere. And you can also deploy it manually to any suitable infrastructure. We'll talk a little bit about what suitable infrastructure means when we get to an architecture diagram in a minute. And you can connect it to the public internet or not, depending on what the needs are of your organization. So uh, 
So usually if you're working with workstations that people are using at home, you'll want to connect things to public internet, but maybe everyone's still on VPN these days, and maybe you do want to keep everything behind your VPN. Then you'd also want to install the fleet control command line tool for management and building packages for installing OS query. And it's that fleet control command line tool that's being used in the demo that you saw when the queries and configuration are applied to fleet and CI. And this URL includes information on how to do the deployment for fleet. So this is at a high level what the infrastructure looks like for fleet. In the center there, you can see there's a fleet server. The fleet server has a couple of infrastructure dependencies, specifically MySQL and Redis. When I say suitable infrastructure, basically I mean you can run fleet anywhere, that you can run a, a server on Linux, and that you can get MySQL and Redis, which means pretty much any cloud platform you can imagine, or even just a bare metal server, something running in your basement if you just want to try this kind of thing at home. You can really do it anywhere. And then you've got your OS query agents communicating with the fleet server, and you've got your API clients, such as that fleet control command line tool, communicating with the fleet server to update those configurations. And then once that's all configured, the logs flow from OS query into the fleet server, and the fleet server then pushes it out to the logging destination. And so the deployment for OS query typically goes like you generate installation packages via fleet using that fleet control command line tool, Windows, MSI packages, PKG on Mac OS, Deb uh, for Debian and Ubuntu Linux distros, RPM for CentOS and Red Hat. And then you'd install those packages via kind of whatever the standard management workflow is that you've got on those machines. So for a lot of folks, that's Chef or Puppet. For workstations, that's often MDM. Anything that can install software packages can be used for this step. And at this URL, there's more information on how you can do that enrollment of your agents. And then for the Matano portion, essentially you install the Matano command line tool. The Matano command deploys all of the resources that you need to AWS. And as I mentioned before, this is all using AWS serverless technologies. So it sets up a bunch of Lambda functions and that kind of thing. And Matano has documents on how to get started with this deployment. This is a little bit of what the, what the architecture of Matano looks like. And again, sort of on the far left, you can see the S3 ingestion. So this is, that, this is where you can imagine the fleet diagram ends with writing the logs out to S3. And the Matano diagram starts with reading the logs in from S3. So it reads the logs in from S3. It runs detections. It saves the results. Uh, it saves the logs into a data lake, and it allows you to do, you know, the detections, alerting, and then historical queries on the data that's there. And for the source control portion, typically folks are going to be using GitHub, but you can use GitLab, Source Hut. Whatever you want, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you have a source control system, you can do Git ops and you can do detections as code. This is optional, but I do think it's a really great practice to configure required approvals for pull requests with, because it just really helps to build discipline on the team that we don't make changes on our own. We always involve other members of the team so that we're building the understanding and we're getting a double check on the on doing the right thing. I think this is just like a great practice to adopt from software engineering into detection engineering and, and security engineering. And then you'll want to configure your continuous integration or CI system to automatically push the changes. So this is what it looks like in GitHub, for example, to require approvals. Just tick a couple of boxes, and then you get that UI built in. And then you have all of this audit log and all this records of who wrote something, who reviewed it, what discussion took place. That's all there as part of your source control system. 
And then this is what the CI configuration looks like. You don't need to fully understand this, but essentially we've just got a few steps where we check out the code, we install the Matano tools, we apply the configurations in Fleet. There's a small script that I wrote for that. And then we apply the Matano configurations. And the Fleet configuration, the, the, the Fleet apply basically looks like this. The top section is just to install the Fleet Control command line tool if it's not there. And then really we just set the configuration and we do the apply. So this runs all automatically each time someone makes a commit and helps to ensure that the changes are all synchronized to the repo. And I want to mention that we talked about a stack and a framework here uh, that uses some tools that I'm familiar with, but really there's many ways to do this. So some alternatives that you could use if you want to build your own stack. For the telemetry portion that we talked about, Fleet and OS Query, there's some free and open source options like uh, free and or open source. Again, back to Stallman, uh, the definition of open source can be a bit complex, but there's things like Sysmon, WinLogBeat, those are pretty specific to Windows. There's Wazoo, Velociraptor, lots of great tools for gathering this data. And then, of course, there's the commercial tools like the EDR vendors, Sentinel One, CrowdStrike, pretty much any of the EDR vendors will provide some way to get data out of those systems. It's not always as robust as you might like, so sometimes people layer on the open source tools to get additional information for their detection engineering practices. And then on the detection side, there's a number of alternatives as well. You could look at projects like ElastAlert, StreamAlert. On the commercial side, a big one these days is Panther, uh, which also really takes the Python detections as code approach. So again, I think you don't really have to take what I'm saying here today as dogma. Take it as an invitation to, to build a system that works well for you and your organization. And some ideas for kind of digging deeper into this. In particular, I think it's worth thinking about the philosophy of, you know, what is detection engineering and why do uh, detections as code? And I think a, a really great piece of philosophy on this is from Palantir. They published on their blog in 2017. You can Google this. Alerting and Detection Strategy Framework, ADS Framework, they call it. And they said these are all the components that you should, that you should generate when creating new detections. So you should have a goal for the detection. You should categorize or tag what the purpose of the detection is. You should have a description of what the strategy is that's being used. You should provide some technical context. You should document what are the assumptions and what might be missed by this strategy. You should document the false positives. And uh, you should provide some documentation or even better automated validation that the detection is working. And some prioritization so that once the detection goes off, the analyst or the or whoever the defender is that's looking at this detection can understand how to prioritize this. And you should have some idea of what the response should be. And I think that one of the cool things that Matano did here is that you saw it only very briefly when I was going through the demo, but in their detection.yaml, they actually have places to document a number of these things. And in the alerts that are generated, they include things like the false positives information, the priority, the response and, and triage steps, the categorization. So it helps to build the context when that alert comes up, helps to build the context for understanding what to do next and why and how. Uh, and one more additional resources. Another great place to dig further into this is through automation. So automate the job of the responder as much as possible. That's kind of a, a general high level idea here. But in particular, you can do things like enrich the logs and alerts. Matano does this. Pretty much any of, of these kind of systems will help to do that. So if there's going to be a step that always needs to take place after some alert fires, don't make the analyst do it. Don't make the responder do it. Build that into the process. 
You can engage end users. So you noticed a suspicious login attempt. You noticed that a that someone just logged in from a country that you don't expect them from. You can engage them through email, chat, Slack, that kind of thing. And there's lots of blogs where people talk about how they've done this kind of thing in the past. And you can use SOAR platforms to kick off uh, additional, you know, more enrichment, but also uh, response actions. And there's a lot of great options, both free and open source for SOAR these days. And testing, I think, is, is super important. So include testing as part of the process. We saw in Palantir's framework, they talked about validation. So I think it's great to request that as someone builds these things, they document how was it tested and how can it be tested in the future. In particular, you can put that kind of thing in the same pull request and you can discuss between the reviewer and the creator how this was done and how it will be maintained in the future. And one tool that might be interesting for looking into is Atomic Red Team. This is also free and open source. And this helps to simulate attacks and might be useful if you're trying to build testing and validation around the detections that you've built. And so I just want to say, like, you can do this. This is, this is, this is something that anyone can do. These tools are free. Like, you can go back to your job or to your home lab and build a system like this today. You can do it with you can do it with off the shelf projects. You can write code yourself. You don't have to be a software engineer and you don't have to be a detection engineer yet to do this. But I do believe that this is going to help kind of all of us in the security industry be more effective, make our organizations more effective and you can do it. So just kind of coming back, I want to I want to remember to understand the concept here. So the concept is detection engineering allows us to be more proactive and more adaptable to the threats that our organization is facing. So we can define those very rigorously. We can build processes to help us enforce those things. We can deploy these tools again. There's a set of tools here, but there's a number of alternatives. So there's not one way to do this. And we, it is really important to establish the process. So again, for an idea of that, take a look at Palantir's ADS process, but there's lots of ways to do this. And I think that the tools help to encourage good practices here. And then iterate, once you've got something going, this is, this is ripe for improvement. So, Make it work once and then do it again. See what you learn, share with the community and share with the others in your organization. I think that these processes, because we've built them ourselves in detection engineering, we have the opportunity to keep making them better. And I think that that's something that's really special and empowering about this. So that's it. Thank you everyone for attending and you can find me in these various places. If you're interested in building these kind of tools, uh, we're hiring at Fleet. And uh, thank you. I think we have about four minutes left if folks have any questions. Please come up to the microphone if you do. So two questions. Uh, the first is, does this stuff come with a set of canned queries for things that you, you know, most uh, security administrators would want to look at? Uh, and then the second is, is there some form of correlation between what should be configured, uh, which we've run through the GitOps process, and what's actually running? Uh, since, you know, that would seem to be kind of the optimal goal, right? Yeah, so for the for the what should you be looking for portion, on the OS query side, there's a number of resources on, on my company's website, fleetdm.com slash queries. We have a number of queries that are recommended as starting points for things to be looking for. The OS query repository itself has some queries that are available there. And again, I'm, I'm shouting out Palantir a lot here, but they published uh, a large set of OS query queries as well. Uh, so there's some good stuff to get started with in that way. And for the, se the second question was about how do you validate that configuration hasn't kind of drifted from where you intend for it to be? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And in in particular with Matano, the only way to configure these things is through kind of detection as code. In fleet and o in, in fleet, when you're configuring the OS query queries, there is also a user interface that you can use to that you can use to do these configurations. And I think that that's where you potentially become more vulnerable to drift. Something that you can do in fleet is there's different permissions levels that users can have, and you can set it so that users can view the queries that are configured, but not actually modify them from the UI. And then you can set it up so that only your UI system can make those changes. And then that will help to prevent drift in that case. You can also do things like have your CI system just do a daily run where it pushes those configurations up. It doesn't have to be just every time a modification is made. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, you should check out Mount Charleston. Uh, it's uh, in prime conditions right now, climbing ways. Uh, and my question is about performance impact. You know, so like, you know, I think the the worst nightmare of security, uh, you know, person is like shutting down the whole endpoint fleet, right? So how uh, prevalent are performance degradation problems, and uh, what are the ways to address them? Yeah, great, great question. So in terms of performance, o like I said, OS Query has really been designed from the ground up to be able to, to be able to deploy it on massive production infrastructures. There's a few things that you have there. So one is we, the code is fairly painstakingly written and, and there are guidelines to how the code is written to ensure that things are as performant as possible. But that does not mean that there's a guarantee that performance will always be acceptable. So what OS Query has built in is something that's called the watchdog, which essentially is there's a worker and watcher process in OS Query where the watcher, its sole job is to look at the resource consumption of the worker. And if that ever exceeds some predefined thresholds, then it will kill the, the worker process. And then it will deny list the query that was running at the time that it was killed so that you don't have runaway queries taking over the, the performance of a machine. Because totally agreed, like the last thing that we ever want as a security team is to take down our organization with our detections. And we're at time now, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you.